Thanks, Laura. Uh, looking at the topic here, um, it's, it's very interesting how obviously the pandemic has affected us all in different ways. Um, but in particular, uh, we thought it would be interesting today to cover how has the pandemic affected asset valuations um, and therefore the balance sheets of uh, companies and how has that then gone on to affect uh, uh, financing and uh, various uh, stakeholders views thereon. Um, how do we how do we view um, the balance sheet? How do we view um, uh, the various assets in that from land and buildings, plant and machinery, um, even brand values and stock? Um, and as I say, how internationally has that affected those corporates from actually being able to raise further financing um, as we come out of the pandemic um, and as we uh, need to uh, gear up for what's coming next? So we have um, put this together with a view from um, a, a lender valuer's perspective, uh, from an auditor's perspective, and then from an advisor to uh, companies in distress. So what I'd like to do is to move on to um, the three great uh, uh, guest speakers uh, that we have. Um, I'll get them each to introduce themselves and then we'll go into the webinar um, and if I can ask you to put the questions in and we will uh, hopefully have some time at the end to answer those questions rather than as we go. So first of all um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, uh, Federica Pitcher-Grand. Um, Federica can you um, uh, introduce yourself please? Thank you Greg. Hello everybody. Uh, I'm a managing director at Brothers Global Advisory Restructuring and Investment Firm. And uh, global approach. We have offices in North America, Canada, South America, Europe, Australia, and Japan. Lovely. Thank you, Federica. Um, and uh, Kjeld, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, please. Yes, thank you, Greg. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to everybody, at least uh, for most of you, I think. Uh, my name is Kjeld Verhoeven. Uh, I'm an auditor and partner at uh, FSV in the Netherlands. Um, and I've been asked to share my thoughts on the COVID-19 effects on businesses from an auditor's perspective. Um, as an auditor already today, uh, nowadays uh, we are uh, busy with uh, most of our interim audits for the 2020 financial statements. And uh, at this moment, we need to consider and evaluate what the effects of COVID-19 are on the financial statements. Superb, Kjell, many thanks. And uh, Tim, if I could ask you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Greg. Afternoon all. So um, my name is Tim Sloggett. I'm based in Bristol in the UK. I've recently joined Smith & Williamson from KPMG. Um, I've worked in, in restructuring for 20 years, um, primarily advising companies and lenders in, in turnaround situations. I'm a licensed consultancy practitioner here in the UK um, and I've worked with a, a huge range of businesses from sort of local owner-managed businesses right through to the uh, administration of, of Thomas Cook. Um, you know, here in the UK at the moment, it's um, unsurprisingly quiet in, in the restructuring world as the, the government support has, has been um, sort of pumped into businesses. So we're, um, we're working with funders at the moment and just trying to work out how we may support them and, and what, the, um, what the potential implications are and how this is all gonna unfold into, uh, into 2021. Lovely, thanks, Tim. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, Greg Palfrey, I'm chair of Nexia TRI and a partner in uh, Smith and Williamson in the UK. Um, so, if we can move to the next uh, slide, and um, if I can pass over Federica to you um, and uh, uh, pass over. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And. I think uh, I, I am. I do not have control of the slides. So, so um, can we start the presentation? Thank you so much. The pandemic, the ongoing pandemic, 
has caused an accelerated disruption of all areas of life. Disrupted the way we work online, disrupted the way we study online, the way we travel, we do not travel, or we try to avoid public transportation, the way we shop online or local, the way we eat at home or delivery, and the way we exercise. I think we are all downloading all sorts of online applications, the way we meet again online. At the end, the way we live, some areas were already affected by a relevant level of disruption. Uh, I just want to mention, for example, the way we shop, the e-commerce. But uh, the current pandemic accelerated all the existing trends at uh, an unbelievable speed. Uh, if you just want to think uh, that in the retail industry, experts uh, believe that uh, the last uh, 10 months uh, accelerated 10 years of change in the retail industry. If we can move to the next slide. The pandemic, uh, as we are all aware, is, is a global issue. Uh, started in China, very soon moved to other countries in Asia, uh, Italy was the first affected country in Europe, uh, together with Germany, but today is a global problem. However, both because of the timing, initially, and uh, of uh, all sorts of relevant circumstances, the response has been a local response and a patchwork response not only on a country basis, but on a local basis. So in order to manage the pandemic, different countries decided to monitor the specific geography affected by the pandemic worldwide in a very, very tailor-made, uh, with a very tailor-made approach. So. UK, they were part of the country like Wales, uh, which uh, were, you know, managed in a more restrictive manner, while other parts of the country uh, were still experiencing a certain level of freedom. And, uh, and the same happened uh, all around the world, uh, a very colorful approach very often. But if we can move to the next slide, we will see that uh, the patchwork response applied also to the solutions that provided to the different tools. I would say that the tools or the ingredients were often the same, but the combination was different. Emergency powers were used everywhere in order to approve specific rules specific laws at the required speed. Finance. Finance is and has been a combination of different tools. Business protection measures combined with financial support and with tax deferrals or relief all combined together uh, in uh, different manners uh, in order to try to support the economy. Restrictions, again, uh, you know, a combination of uh, uh, face mask, uh, social distancing, uh, you know, business closures, uh, uh, curfew, uh, lockdowns uh, in different countries at different times. Insolvency law. Insolvency law and regimes have been amended in a temporary manner or with long-term solutions everywhere in the world. If we, will, if we think about some, you know, some temporary measures like no winding up petitions or no wrongful trading measures, these are all 
at the end uh, insolvency rules uh, aimed at uh, containing uh, the risk uh, of, of a, a tremendous amount of insolvency petitions uh, in uh, the courts worldwide. But some countries also adopted some entirely new regimes, regimes that which uh, were, uh, you know, discussed for uh, some time already uh, and have been suddenly approved in order to cope with the emergency, uh, UK, uh, or regimes which uh, were due to enter into force, uh, like in the Netherlands or Italy and in Germany. Uh, also in Brazil, they are at the moment discussing a new insolvency reform. I must say that personally, I am somehow concerned because I'm not sure that uh, introducing a, no, a new law in uh, a time already uncertain is uh, the best solution uh, because somehow adds uncertainty uh, to the existing complexity. But, uh, these a few slides uh, were just uh, to collect uh, all uh, the complexity that uh, we are facing worldwide and uh, to underline that uh, if we are all experiencing uh, the same problem, the same problem is uh, addressed in a similar but uh, not always uh, identical way in different countries, which for business create additional complexity if possible. Imagine you have a business that operates worldwide and in each single country, you need to address different restrictions to apply for different financial aids and, and to face with an ongoing pandemic that uh, can constantly change the timing and, uh, and the situation you are working with. If we can move to the next slide. This uh, is a chart that uh, wants to measure the intensity, uh, the intensity of the problems that the pandemic created and the consequences, the financial consequences that pandemic created in different countries. And as you will see, US and UK are very badly affected. This brings us to an additional element, which is external to the pandemic. Some countries like US, uh, you know, experience uh, the additional complexity of uh, the presidential election. The country has been uh, in an electoral mode for the entire duration of the pandemic. And of course, uh, that uh, created delays and, um, and scrutiny and um, discussions uh, over the different measures adopted, not always uh, with, uh, you know, the long-term solution in mind. UK is facing a different problem, is facing Brexit and, uh, and the struggle to achieve an agreement uh, with the European Union. This, uh, of course, uh, created some constraints uh, in, uh, in a long-term planning. Uh, because of some elements uh, of uh, the ever-changing, uh, you know, scenario were even more uncertain uh, than uh, the usual. If we can move to the, to the next slide, I wanted to, to discuss with you uh, some recent trends in the retail industry, uh, in the brand, industry and more in general in commercial and industrial. Gordon Brothers is uh, an asset focus uh, uh, business uh, and uh, we have extensive experience in these asset classes. 
And I tried to summarize some trends and outlooks for the purpose of our conversation. As I mentioned before, retail experienced a tremendous acceleration of the existing disruptive trends towards e-commerce and online. But uh, retail was uh, experiencing also other trends. For example, another interesting trend is local. And local uh, is a trend that uh, had a, a tremendous growth during the pandemic. People were working from home, studying from home, and were shopping locally. People did not want to use public transportation and, uh, and preferred the small stores to large department stores. But also polarization is uh, an interesting trend. Uh, consumers uh, were buying less and more expensive or more and less expensive or were just disrupting their you know habits uh, during uh, the pandemic and uh, it it has been proven that some of these habits will stay after the pandemic but uh, how the retail industry is reacting. The retail industry is investing in logistics, larger warehouses, um, sophisticated uh, supply chain uh, strategies, and, uh, and transportation. And, uh, and is investing, of course, uh, in e-commerce and online presence. Everything to strengthen to strengthen the fidelity of uh, the consumers, because uh, switching to online, consumers uh, experience uh, a great competition among uh, online retailers. My like other products, uh, my like other services, but they still want uh, timely delivery. So retail industry is influenced uh, in the short term by store closures and the definition of essential business. Uh, all countries uh, are implementing different definitions. Um, you know, per farmer is uh, my uh, we consider essential business or not. And uh, and what about hairdresser? Um, so. Each single country has implemented a different definition and it's interesting how retailers have adopted local uh, opening specific corners that would uh, allow a specific store to stay open uh, during uh, the restriction. But uh, there are influences also by some long-term factors, uh, unemployment and uh, or generally the consumer confidence. Definitely, definitely the encouraging news about vaccines helped a lot, but the consumer confidence is still very low. Everything affected the value of all retail assets. The stock, we are expecting a huge quantity of unsold stock. The brand values, uh, as we will see in a moment, uh, affected negatively by the overall pandemic and retail crisis. The real estate, possibly, uh, the, possibly the category which will suffer most, the asset that will suffer most, in particular real estate uh, linked to the retail industry. And uh, we will see in a moment some interesting trends. The debt, definitely badly affected. This is a more country specific issue. Uh, some countries adopted uh, some uh, state guarantees in order to allow companies have access uh, to financing. Uh, 
some other countries just provided money to you know the consumers rather than the businesses uh, but uh, there is a main difference that uh, i want to bring to your attention uh, which is the regulatory framework uh, not uh, in uh, all countries uh, the financing market uh, the lending offer allows uh, known banks or non-regulated entities to provide financing and uh, that uh, had uh, a tremendous impact uh, on uh, together with uh, the efficiency of uh, the banking system and the strength of the local banking system uh, to the way uh, you know the economy uh, managed to have access to liquidity and and i would expect also in the way the economy will recover in different countries if we can move to the next slide there are some retailers uh, that um, have been doing well and uh, here i'm talking of the digitally native retailers uh, and the omnichannel retailers uh, with the strong online presence as I mentioned before, uh, these retailers uh, have been heavily investing uh, in the online presence, uh, in the logistic, uh, and in their supply chain. But also other retailers, uh, the essential good providers, uh, we are spending more time at home, we are eating at home, and, um, and of course, uh, the cooking and eating at home um, trend helped the demand for essential goods. Uh, we are not sure if uh, this uh, trend uh, will last uh, after the pandemic. Uh, the discount providers, uh, you know, we have seen it during uh, the last financial cri crisis uh, that, uh, you know, consumer confidence, low consumer confidence uh, and uh, lower uh, discretionary income drive uh, the demand uh, for uh, discounted products. And so discount providers have been doing pretty well during the pandemic. And uh, home improvements as for the pet products also have been doing pretty well. <laughs> and uh, we changed the time, uh, you know, the way we spend our day, we spend our free time. And, and with the way we spend our money, we expect these trends uh, to last after the pandemic uh, to some degree or to large degree. Um, if we can move to the next slide, retail is strictly connected with uh, brands and brands value. Uh, the, the trend has been negative. Uh, brands value has been negatively affected by the retail crisis. Uh, but uh, brands with a strong identity and a stronger online presence uh, um, will uh, come back faster uh, than, uh, like, let's say, the value of the brands uh, with a uh, strong identity and stronger online presence uh, will uh, recover faster than other assets. Uh, in particular, luxury brands uh, will uh, bounce back faster. Uh, brands uh, are investing uh, on the online, in the online presence, uh, uh, licensing, and the cooperation. Um, the value of a brand uh, as an asset class uh, is uh, really the economic value of uh, of uh, the the capacity of the brand to produce royalties to be an appealing brand for uh, the purpose of license agreements. Uh, licensing might apply to geographies, uh, so licensing the brand in uh, different countries, to product categories, licensing the brand uh, in other product categories, or cooperation with other brands. And we are seeing very interesting cooperation at the moment, uh, Louis Vuitton and NBA, uh, but also, you know, Stone Island and Moncler. Uh, 
very, very interesting cooperation on the market aimed at a common vision and a common identity strategy to move the brand from awareness to fidelity and, uh, and to fight the risk that uh, I, I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, that the consumer might experiencing uh, new brands, uh, new services, uh, and, uh, and fidelity is, uh, is really crucial at the moment uh, in the strategy of brand owners but also consolidation among brands. The brand industry is influenced by the retail trends, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, by the identity and fidelity. So values, uh, the value of uh, diversity, of inclusion, of sustainability. Uh, consumer confidence, uh, of course, uh, has uh, a very strong on brands as well, but uh, the consumer confidence uh, will, uh, will bounce back uh, and the brands uh, will react faster. The effect on value has been in generally negative. Uh, the luxury apparel brands uh, have lost uh, about 20% uh, in value and uh, in general uh, the apparel industry uh, you know, should probably, these are, you know, the analysis lose about 1 trillion in value. Um, we must say that some brands uh, are doing well, Amazon, Netflix, WhatsApp, uh, you know, TV channels uh, are all doing pretty well during the pandemic for obvious reasons, but uh, all the other brands uh, are suffering. And uh, this has uh, an interesting impact because uh, there is a new trend of uh, real estate investors uh, investing in brands. It's a trend that uh, we are experiencing uh, in the US. Uh, very recently, Authentic Brand Group uh, partnered with Simon Properties uh, investing in Brooks Brothers. Authentic Brand Group is a brand investor. Simon Properties is a real estate retail investor. And they decided to partner in order to invest and save in a very large apparel brand retailer. This is a very interesting trend that in a way, it suggests an exit strategy to the current retail crisis that uh, could possibly be replicated abroad. However, we are not sure that abroad there are landlords large enough for uh, such a strategy. In the UK, we very recently experienced uh, you know, something very different. Uh, um, Clarks, uh, for example, is a case where landlords uh, have been uh, heavily jeopardized by the very recent uh, uh, approval of uh, Clarks uh, CVA. Uh, something uh, like uh, 60 stores uh, will uh, not pay rental uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, it would be interesting uh, to monitor and, uh, and to see uh, if uh, the very recent US trend will uh, also develop abroad. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, I would like to move with you to a very different industry and uh, more complex industry and a larger industry possibly. Uh, commercial and industrial. Um, here, the trends are not linear and, uh, and very heavily interconnected. Um, we are experiencing, uh, uh, in general, negative or stable trends uh, where smaller and younger business are suffering more. 
the the negative trend is affected by the supply chain, uh, by the distribution channel, uh, by the sending channel, and by customer behavior. Um, you know, customers uh, are cancelling orders, uh, are not confirming orders. All the forecasts uh, for 2019-2020 have been uh, just disrupted. Uh, but also by some industry uh, existing trends uh, like uh, aviation and oil and gas negative trends affected many industries. Uh, negative, uh, um, all these negative trends affected all asset classes involved, uh, but we, ex we expected that uh, uh, the recovery uh, will not be linear. And if we can move to the other slide, uh, I want to give you some uh, highlights. Uh, um, and some examples. Um, pharmaceutical industry. We are talking about COVID. I thought uh, uh, it was a clear example. Uh, the pandemic uh, is having a significant impact on the healthcare industry. And uh, spending for non essential medications uh, have fallen. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, we are experiencing a lot of investing uh, in. Um, you know, a potential vaccine or treatment. Um, ground support equipment uh, is uh, suffering uh, the, you know, the, the extremely negative effect that COVID is having uh, on, uh, uh, you know, air transportation worldwide. Uh, steel industry uh, is, uh, is interesting because it's contracting sharply. Uh, Due to reduction in production, uh, but uh, also is uh, suffering uh, the oil and gas uh, crisis. And uh, metal working machinery, uh, the value is decreasing, uh, not just because of the a decrease in the demand, uh, but also because uh, you know manufacturers have increased significantly discounts on new products and. Uh, and the entire, uh, you know, auction system uh, moved online or very often postponed uh, the sales uh, after the pandemic. Um, interesting de development uh, in uh, the telecom manufacturing equipment uh, because, um, you know, the sales increased uh, due to the working from home trend, but at the very same time decreased uh, in relation to campus and university. However, we expect the sector to bounce back very quickly uh, because of the 5G expected. So this slide I wanted to give you some examples, uh, but also to highlight uh, what is uh, a non-linear trend uh, in, uh, you know, in the industrial and commercial world. Of course, uh, all of these uh, you know, negative to stable trend in in the asset valuation and an unclear timing for a possible possible recovery, driven mostly by a vaccine, affected you know the the lending scene. And as I mentioned before, the lending scene should be analyzed on a country by country basis. Um, banking system, uh, alternative lenders, uh, regulatory issues. But uh, if we wanted to find a common trend, I think uh, uncertainty, uh, cooperation uh, from uh, the lenders uh, and uh, concern possible reduction of the borrowing base in relation to asset-based lending, and definitely the need of more frequent valuations, more frequent appraisals. And, and, there, is a, and there is a, in that some uh, level of concern, uh, because of course uh, that could uh, also uh, affect uh, uh, operationally uh, the entire uh, lending industry. Um, but uh, this uh, is uh, 
really uh, the core of our topic uh, that uh, uh, team and killed and uh, and uh, my friends uh, here in the panel uh, will uh, analyze further with you. Greg, I think you are on mute. Yes, I was muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, thanks for that, uh, Federica. A um, uh, uh, lot of area to cover, and I think um, you know what what we're hearing is obviously asset classes have been uh, affected, lenders have been affected. I know you and I have discussed uh, uh, at least one quite innovative uh, solution on funding, um, actually uh, motor vehicles on the high seas. Uh, to produce liquidity for um, one of the big motor manufacturers. And I think there's there's a lot of um, uh, innovation out there and a lot of ways of raising finance. Um, so thank you very much for covering that um, in terms of all the various issues. Um, I'm sure there'll be a number of questions at the end. Uh, that then leads us on, Keld. Um, we've heard what happens uh, to asset values and financing those. Um, but how do you think uh, that now is, is going to affect your view as an auditor when you're looking at uh, client balance sheets and uh, and you're advising them? Over to you, Kjeld. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, yes, uh, well, um, the my thoughts and considerations today are, are uh, based on my day-to-day -day audit practice in the Netherlands. Um, and my audit clients uh, range from large to medium sized. And a lot of them have multiple countries uh, or, or have businesses in multiple countries. So uh, we are facing uh, a, a huge challenge uh, with the audit uh, of 2020 and of probably also for 2021. And uh, I would like to share your, my thoughts with you on, on how we deal with that. Uh, just the basic, uh, uh, the audit of financial statements is, of course, focused on, on giving assurance that the audited financial statements uh, give a true and fair view of the balance sheet and the P&L of, of this company. Uh, but a true and fair view, uh, however, does not only apply on the financial numbers at a balance sheet moment, but also focuses uh, and looking forward when the company uses the going concern principle and um, uh, looking back, of course, uh, previous crisis uh, going concern has always been an, a, a major topic, but uh, nowadays it's, it's, it's a big issue. Um, let me first summarize uh, the main aspects of, of, of drafting financial statements, the audit and, and the effects of COVID-19 on this. Well, even without the COVID-19 uh, situation, preparation and, and audit of financial statements is, is a time-consuming process involving management of the company, governance bodies, uh, and of course, auditors. And for each of these parties, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, makes the process more complex. And uh, what we see now is that uh, the problem of COVID-19 in this process is that we see an unprecedented uncertainty about the economy at this moment, but also the economy of, of uh, future earnings. And given this uncertainty, um, preparers of financial statements, which uh, uh, in the Netherlands where uh, uh, fiscal year or accounting year is, is almost the same as, as uh, calendar year, we now see that management in most cases, the preparers of the financial statements um, uh, have problems looking forward um, and uh, not only in the short term, but also um, in the medium term because of the ongoing lockdown situation. Um, so preparers have the situation that they, they um, um, might feel uncomfortable um, uh, preparing the financial statements, for auditors, the problem will be to obtain timely and sufficient audit evidence. Um, uh, also due to restrictions on travel, going to client locations, change control environments at clients, uh, this makes it more, more and more complex. Nevertheless, uh, for giving an auditor's opinion, still the international standards on auditing apply in full. So um, um, that, gives some, that gives some headaches sometimes. 
Can I see the next slide? Um, financial statements are, are not only based on hard financial numbers uh, that can be checked with third party documents like, like for instance, bank statements. Uh, a huge part of the numbers are based on judgments made by management like uh, for instance, uh, impairment, fair value, and of course also the going concern principle. Uh, the, the, challenge, the challenging part for me as an auditor is always to give professional a judgment on these, these non-hard aspects of the financial statements. Um, auditors need to consider uh, whether uh, additional experts are necessary as part of the audit team for, uh, for, for having additional assessment capacity, especially when uh, we, we have situations where the judgment by, by, by management is, is um, well, we, we see potential issues uh, in that. Um, also the audit is, uh, every audit is, is also based on, on using a materiality level uh, in order to, to evaluate audit evidence. Um, a materiality level, when we use it in the audit, is, is often based on benchmarks like EBIT or revenue. Um, well, given this current situation with COVID-19, uh, some of these benchmarks may not longer be acceptable or give an outcome that is not workable for us as an auditor. Like for instance, uh, I've been last week to one of, one of my larger clients. They have a, a web shop, uh, online web shop for uh, selling lamps and fixtures and they almost because of COVID-19 they almost tripled their revenue compared to last year well which of course is very good uh, on the other hand to be able to do this kind of amount of additional business they had to let's say set aside all their internal control environment uh, because otherwise they could not have done that kind of business so uh, for me as an auditor using then because of the higher revenues uh, uh, using a higher materiality level uh, uh, would be the wrong way because I have uh, an internal control system that was completely gone for at least six or seven months. Um, on the other hand, what we now also see is that um, uh, local regulators, at least in the Netherlands are also uh, uh, presenting all sorts of standard language that that should be needed in annual statements, but also in auditors' opinions uh, that limits us as auditors to actually uh, uh, demonstrate professional judgment. And in some cases even can contradict with the, the actual situation the client is in. But um, also for the regulators, we see that a lot of this situation is completely new and, and uh, they're trying also the best they can, but. Uh, sometimes this um, this gives for us uh, uh, difficult situations. Can I see the next slide? Um, part of the audit, of course, is is a risk assessment planning. Uh, we already started that for the 2020 audits uh, during the summer. When uh, at that point uh, it looked like the COVID-19 issue would would. Um, become less of a problem, but uh, here we are today. Um, and during this risk assessment planning, we need to identify or we need to evaluate the potential risk of mis misstatements. Um, but we see now the current environment just increases the risk of misstatements. So I mentioned a couple here on, on, on my slide. Um, during our recent interim audits, we already concluded, we already discovered a, a number of them. Uh, uh, what we see is that we have clients that have uh, an earnout situation with management, and of course, uh, the, the current situation with, with less profit or less revenue uh, is, is affecting this earnout situation. And we already discovered that management was trying uh, to, to organize or to, to save it for themselves and uh, try to, to, to present the, the numbers better than they were. Uh, also, the loss of financing capabilities uh, due to the loss of, uh, of uh, uh, revenues and uh, expected losses. Um, we see, what we already see is that 
banks and financial institutions are, are pushing the clients for information, already uh, forecasting, um, which gives, of puts a lot of pressure on, on, these, uh, on the clients and management of the client. Um, I mentioned the internal control environment of this client of mine. Um, we have to rely on the, on the control environment. Uh, we need to evaluate the operating effectiveness and given the current situation, uh, the, the operating effectiveness is, is of course sometimes very questionable, at least when uh, half of the staff is working from home uh, and does not actual, um, uh, um, uh, actually can verify or, 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 or uh, operate controls from uh, where, where the business actually is happening. Can I see the next slide? Um, of course, uh, we're trying to, as an auditor, we always need to try to, to find the, uh, the, the audit evidence. Um, yeah, at this moment, uh, we already experienced that uh, some clients do not want us um, at their location. Uh, um, sometimes we're not able to obtain original documents eh, when, we, when we need to check uh, contracts or whatever, uh, sometimes a large number of, of, of documents we need to go through. We're not allowed at the, at the location of the client. Uh, one of the biggest problem will be year-end stock taking. Uh, we have a number of large international uh, trading clients where stock and inventory is, is the, the highest uh, value on, on the balance sheet. Um, but in, in a number of cases, uh, the clients uh, do not allow us uh, to come over or do not want us to come over. Um, so uh, that might raise uh, issues when, when, in the end, when giving the audit uh, opinion. And of course, uh, travel, I, I mentioned it before. Uh, what we also see is due to everybody working from home that uh, we have delays in responding to questions or requests for information. On the other hand, we see also uh, that, that new techniques and tools are, are introduced and accepted to, for us to find solutions for getting the audit evidence. Um, uh, we already see uh, re remote access to client systems. Uh, we even have clients where we need to look at security security camera footage to actually see that some of the uh, controls still are operating. Um, and we also see live video feeds when, when we, in some cases, try to check inventory at, uh, at clients. Can I see the next slide? Um, well, like mentioned before, uh, accounting estimates made by, by management are, uh, are, are always uh, a challenge from an audit perspective. Uh, but at this moment, accounting estimates uh, are, are most by management are mostly based on, on prior periods, experience in prior periods. Um, but now we see that historic data in the current situation may not be representative. Um, and we also see that balance sheet items that never used some sort of uh, uh, accounting estimates now need it. Uh, because of the uh, because of the effects of uh, of COVID nineteen, um, at this moment, especially uh, determining fair value or value in use for assets uh, without uh, reliable data, that's 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 a, a big a big challenge. Uh, also, when when we get data from clients uh, where they say that they they use for impairment or or fair value measurement. Uh, the question is whether this data is, is, is in fact reliable. Um, like what, what Frederica said already also, for, especially for international groups, uh, we have that the situ COVID-19 situation in different jurisdictions uh, is different. And uh, uh, that un unlike uh, in previous years, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, come up with an estimate that covers all jurisdictions, but we need to, um, uh, we need to evaluate especially um, uh, situations where economies will not open at the same time uh, and, uh, and how that will affect future earnings. 
Um, especially with, with uh, fair value and impairment, we, we, we need more um, valuation experts to, to assist us in, in the audit. However, at this moment, we already uh, experienced that um, there is a huge demand now for, uh, for such experts. So uh, this will also affect um, um, uh, the audit as well. Can I see the next slide? Um, well, probably the, the most crucial question from, from an auditor's point of view uh, is, is, uh, is the ability to evaluate going concern, um, especially for management, but of course for, for us as auditors as well. Uh, uh, when, when, when clients are, are affected heavily by, by COVID-19. Um, normally a going concern assumption for us as an auditor, uh, we need some sort of cash flow or earning forecast for at least for the next 12 months. Um, well, in that case, significant judgments need to be made, but uh, currently lockdowns, disrupted supply chains, uh, have already resulted in losses in income and of course the uncertainty to to look for that in the next 12 months um, makes it extremely uh, extremely difficult um, uh, like will will um, have we, we have questions or discussions with uh, with clients that uh, when the, when the economy opens up again will customer behavior be the same as as before the crisis or will, it definitely changed. Change. Uh, like the com company I said next, the web or I, I talked about before, this uh, web shop in lamps and fixtures, um, they expect that they will definitely stay above uh, previous expectations, even when the COVID-19 situation uh, will be, uh, well, will, will not have that much effect anymore. They still, uh, expect that they will be um, uh, much more profitable than, than before. Um, of course, uh, uh, current financial situation statements will need uh, more and expanded disclosures with respect to going concern and the effects of COVID-19. Um, can I see the next slide? Um, so, Already what we, what we see now, because I told you we are in the middle of, of, of most of our interim audits already, we are already in discussion with management on, on the process of evaluating going concern. Um, like I told you, we all, uh, clients are already uh, approached by banks and financial institutions with, with initial assessments. Um, and the biggest, Big, the biggest concern for, for our clients at the moment is, is uh, liquidity and, and staying solvent. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, governmental, um, uh, we, we are, I, I think at the moment in the third or fourth governmental aid program, a lot of companies in the Netherlands uh, made use of that, uh, but it also brings the, the, the risk of repayment because um, the government drafted some criteria based on which you could get this uh, governmental aid. Uh, but uh, we already dis uh, discovered and we already saw that a lot of companies took the money um, uh, beforehand, and, but they will still have a problem because a number of the criteria will not be met. And uh, of course, when they have to repay that this will lead to, to uh, well, this may lead to additional um, issues. Um, we also uh, already experienced that uh, this governmental aid might have a, a international effect for clients that are part of an international group. Um, because one of the restrictions is that if the, in, if the, the Dutch company gets governmental aid, uh, the mother company, even if it's in another country, it will not be allowed to pay out any dividends. So uh, I have uh, at this moment a client uh, where the parent company is in Switzerland. Uh, uh, they, the Swiss company wants to pay out dividends to their shareholders. Uh, however, if, they, if they're going to do that, then that means that the Dutch 
company that already received about 2 million governmental aid is, is uh, probably forced to pay back this 2 million. So uh, there's, there's a lot of discussion on, on whether this is, um, whether this, this criteria is, is, a, is a good situation. Um, also the aligning between companies in a national group will be, will be challenging, uh, especially some countries and jurisdictions have uh, expanded their uh, time limits for, for filing and audit. Uh, yeah, when you need to consolidate this, this will also, uh, uh, well, be a challenge. Um, yes. Um, can I see the next slide? Okay. Um, looking forward, we're not there at this moment yet, but uh, in the next couple of months, when we first uh, finalize our first uh, uh, audits for, for completely uh, 2020. Uh, we need to look at subsequent events. Uh, of course, uh, clients where we will finish in January is, is more easy than, than clients where we um, uh, have a couple of months more to, to finalize. Uh, what we now see is, is uh, two situations. Clients want to postpone the audit to get a better feeling on what the future will bring. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, some, of the, some of this governmental aid uh, needs also to be audited and clients want to be sure that they don't want, that they don't need uh, to repay that. Uh, so um, uh, th there's a mixture of trying to, to get the audit uh, uh, upfront or, or, or later on. Um, can I see the next slide? Um, yeah, so um, uh, finally, um, uh, also together with uh, the, the professional bodies uh, worldwide, but also in the Netherlands. Uh, so looking forward to the next couple of months, uh, um, we see that uh, we identified four key audit risks for 2020. Uh, I mentioned this before, but many companies have a serious internal control breakdown uh, with people working from home. Um, so we as an auditor need to consider where we can rely on this operating effectiveness. Uh, and, if, and if not, whether we can do additional substantive work, uh, but also for this, Audit companies are already complaining that uh, this is more time consuming and a lot of firms do not have the capacity or enough staff to do this uh, additional work. Um, at this moment, the fraud, work, fraud risk is considered higher than usual. Uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, created uh, a perfect storm for fraud um, because based on the three elements for fraud, incentive, opportunity, and rationalize, rationalization, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, we see already a lot of clients uh, that uh, that this risk has has increased. And uh, like I said, what we see at the moment is that a lot of companies that use this governmental aid. Uh, are, are trying to reach the criteria on paper uh, because you know when when you uh, some some of the criteria might be that in a, a couple uh, in a period of time you uh, you lost more than thirty percent revenue okay when you are a company and you only lost twenty eight percent revenue then you have no uh, right on governmental aid so what we see now that clients are looking for this uh, this other two percent. Uh, so that's, that's, that makes um, the audit and the risk of fraud uh, uh, additionally higher. Um, also, of course, that um, um, what we see now is that uh, the uh, use of accounting estimates by clients uh, to influence the financial statements. We've seen that already as well. Uh, most of those aspects are not for personal gain of management itself, but focused on survival of the company. Uh, and uh, also um, the, the last one is, is also like uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy of the auditor's opinion, mentioning going concern might be an issue 
uh, that uh, already banks and financial institutions will say based on this audit opinion that they will no longer um, um, uh, finance this company. So this, this will raise, uh, well, let's say more or less uh, ethical and more, more moral dilemmas for the auditor. So um, thank you very much. Um, the perspective from from uh, from uh, from an auditor in all this uh, in this situation, uh, well, it it will be an extreme challenge for a large number of our clients, but uh, but also for us as auditors as well. Well, many thanks for that. Um, I guess who would be an auditor? Uh, it's been difficult enough uh, up to now, um, and COVID has just made it that much harder. So I guess we've heard uh, we've heard that the valuation and the funders' perspective is is pretty tricky. We've heard that the um, uh, uh, actual auditor uh, perspective is getting harder. Um, and I know, having having been in the industry for thirty plus years, that when you are entering uh, a recession um, uh, reperiod, it's very difficult. When you come out the other side, uh, it can actually get harder with people needing liquidity. And the banks perhaps not wanting to put too much out asset values as we've heard of course a problem um and uh, where do you get the money from how do you keep going if you've you know spent the last year or two really fighting fires and i think what that means is that there's going to be a huge amount of necessity and need for uh, our advisory services in nexia tri and therefore i'd like to welcome uh, tim sloggett who's one of my newest partners um, in the uh, uh, restructuring uh, space in the UK. Uh, Tim, um, uh, what are you seeing and, and how can we help our clients? Thanks, Greg. So, um, so what, what have we seen so far, um, I guess, through the, through the pandemic? Um, now, I failed miserably in trying to find any useful statistics on, uh, on company debt levels um, through the pandemic. Um, but what we can say with certainty is in the UK so far and largely replicated around the world, um, is there have been unprecedented levels of debt pumped into businesses. Um, in the UK, this is estimated at around 70 billion in the first half of 2020 alone. Um, and it's largely been you know, to cover trading losses due to the, the lower activity. Um, and, but actually in terms of working capital, the impact has actually been fairly limited with um, with customers generally continuing to pay debts, um, partly because you know so much so much funding has been pumped into these businesses. Um, so in the in the UK, um, invoice discounting is one of the sort of mainstream sources of working capital funding, um, and you know all of the invoice discounting providers that we speak to have also reported that there's been no issues with with collections of debts. Um, you know, all, all, all the money has continued to come in through the through the lockdowns and through through the pandemic. Um, but there is sort of one main challenge that um, invoice discounting causes and, and provides to businesses um, when you have sort of these stop start scenarios and these various lockdowns. So, so this table basically just shows in a, it's kind of a very basic high level illustration. Um, of how businesses that came into COVID-19 with a, with a fully drawn invoice discounting facility may have been impacted. So quite simply, um, when you go into a, you know, when you go into a, a lockdown, no new invoices would have been generated, which means that as the debtor receipts come in, they would be used to repay the invoice discounting facility. Um, and then that would lead to, lead to, to, to cash flow issues. So, um, so those with invoice discounting facilities just adds a, another layer of complexity. Um, it's you know another layer that they have to deal with and, and potentially leading to additional working capital issues. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So um, so what are the potential implications for for companies and lenders? Um, you know another thing that that we can say with certainty in this pandemic is that. All the predictions so far have been wrong. Um, you know, we're in uncharted waters. Um, we still don't know what the potential fallout is going to be. So I'm not going to make any any predictions here. But sort of sim you know, simplistically, um, lenders provide funding to viable businesses, and 
they have security against the assets of a business um, as, as a fallback, and that's whether it's a, a mainstream bank or specialist asset-based lenders. So as a result, um, potentially reduced asset valuations in some specific areas, as well as um, you know, potential going concern issues that have been highlighted today, could result in sort of increased risk for lenders, um, and therefore they may end up requesting increased security from companies on existing debt to mitigate this risk. Um, there could potentially be reduced lending appetite for new lending as well. Um, and potentially, you know, I said I'm not going to make any predictions, but you know, there could potentially be uh, increased losses for lenders as we go into 2021 and beyond. Um, and based on the, you know, the financial crash that we had in 2008, this then led to um, banks doing uh, debt for equity swaps to mitigate their risk and, 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 and avoid crystallization of their losses, um, and also debt portfolio sales. And, and this has actually happened this week in the UK. So um, one of the funders here in the UK, Funding Circle, which is a, a small business funder, has actually sold some of its debt to a, to a USP fund. Um, there's various um, things in the press around, around that. Um, so what does this mean for companies that operate in those, in those sectors impacted? Well, in terms of you know, existing term debt and asset finance, such as higher purchase for machinery, well, that should be unaffected. It's, it's, it's term facilities, um, it's there, and uh, you know, there's not much lenders can do about those unless there are um, covenants that, that are breached. Um, and then for, for sort of uncommitted short-term working capital facilities such as um, overdrafts and revolving credit facilities, um, there could be uh, a request for, you know, coming down the line from lenders for additional security um, or, or, or potentially reduction in facilities. So, so companies need to be thinking about this and, and planning for these scenarios. Um, debt for equity swaps means that there will be a loss of control for some business owners and lenders are going to have a, you know, a, a different seat around the table and, and have much more active roles in businesses. Um, and portfolio sales can also cause challenges to, to companies. Effectively, who, who, you know, who they borrow the money from will change. Um, there will be a new stakeholder to manage. And in the last recession, what we did see was, was um, portfolio sales to, to some PE funds, um, which led to Kind of a more aggressive stance from the new lender because they had effectively purchased the debt at a discount so it makes the it makes the downside insolvency scenario become more attractive for them um if we go on to the next slide please so what can companies companies do about this how can they how can they mitigate the risk well all roads lead to having a, a credible plan um, you know, lenders and auditors will need to see this. It's fundamental for a business in these situations for, for survival. Um, now, turnaround is a huge area to cover. Um, I don't, don't have time to cover all the aspects of this. I could talk about this all day. Um, but just, just very, you know, in very high level terms, can the business drive new sales? Can it enter new markets? You know, can it, can it develop new products? Can it enter into strategic mergers or partnerships to to increase the top line, um, and where you know where 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 that's not possible, how do you refocus on the core operations? Um, and it sounds really simple, but um, but do you know as a, as a as a business, do you really understand where you make and lose money? Um, you know, it's amazing how many businesses that that I work with that just don't really properly understand that and have a real detailed handle on that. Um, and once you've worked that that out, you can start think about thinking about um, you know, can you exit underperforming elements, underperforming contracts? Um, can you, you know, exit underperforming divisions, for example? Can you reprice, or or can you cut costs to make those elements of the business viable? Um, and then once you have that, you know, once you have that plan, a key thing is obviously, do you have the time and the funds to implement that plan? Um, you know, the turnaround plans take time. There will be bumps along the road. You need headroom. Um, you, you generally need headroom in, in, in your funding to, to, to get through them. Um, you know, if the answer is no, can you get the funding? 
um, in, in the UK. There are a number of specialist debt and equity funders that will fund turnaround situations. So we would work with businesses in this scenario to facilitate, to facilitate this. Um, and also can you use restructuring tools to help reduce the funding requirement or buy the business more time to, um, to implement the plan? So you know, as, as Federica mentioned earlier, insolvency laws have changed around the world. We've got a new moratorium facility uh, process in the UK to help big, give businesses breathing space. We've also got um, a new restructuring plan to, to effectively help business to, to suspend or reduce payments to creditors. So these are both aimed at, at supporting companies to, to implement turnaround plans. Um, and if the answer is no to, to all of the above, or, or, or you know, there's a high degree of uncertainty and risk around implementing a plan, then directors need to be protecting the downside position, um, thinking about other options. So can you sell the business? You know, could could you run a could you run a sell process alongside other options as a fallback? Um, would an orderly wind down of of the business maximise the value and, and protect the creditors? Is that the best? You know, is it is it best to just call it a day and actually rather than leave it too late when the creditors' position may have worsened? Is it is it better to to actually do an orderly wind down? Um, and directors will always need in these scenarios specialist advice. In the UK, this would be a lawyer and uh, a licensed insolvency practitioner. Um, the directors need to be, you know, making sure that they're taking all the necessary actions to uh, to mitigate the downside risk and to protect the creditors. And and obviously, they need to put in place appropriate governance to to um, have appropriate controls in place and um, and make sure that they're sort of documenting decisions and, and documenting the advice. So that's, uh, that's it from me. Tim, thank you uh, very much. Disappointed that you didn't have more uh, predictions, actually. Uh, uh, that crystal ball uh, gazing that many of us are asked all the time, what, what's coming down the pike? And I think, as you said, um, uh, one of the big things has been how unpredictable everything has been and the uncertainty, the unpredictability um, and what the new norm is going to be and in the various sectors. I think, you know, we, we've touched upon, um, all three of you have, um, and uh, thank you very much for that. I think, you know, the perspective of a valuer, uh, a, a lender, an auditor, uh, an advisor, um, you know, life is so very difficult now in, in what is coming, but I think it is very much um, what we're looking at is it's back to basics in many uh, uh, respects. Um, you know, cash is king, having good sound systems, having a good business plan, uh, talking to the right advisors at the right time, I think are all um, uh, key uh, areas um, that, as I say, mean that it, it really is back to basics. Um, what I'd like to do, um, I think we, we can move to, uh, for those, uh, still quite a few people who are, who've remained on, um, and uh, I think we